let's go ahead and get started. So good morning, guys. It is Wednesday, May 27th. This is a biology class. So thank you, you guys, for joining me. And those of you that aren't here, as always, you can watch this on YouTube and catch up in your own time. And just reach out to me if you have any questions. So let's go ahead and look at the homepage of Schoology. Um, you'll notice, oh, hold on, my page froze. Uh, you'll notice, uh oh, something's lagging here. Sorry, guys. There it is. Okay. You'll notice that on your calendar, um, you don't have any assignments posted yet. And that's because, um, like I was telling Felipe, I'm trying to scramble to figure out how we're going to end this year. We have two weeks left. So we have um, obviously this Wednesday and Friday, but then we have next week, the week of June 1st through the 5th. And then the week of June 8th through 12th would, and let me show you your calendar actually, check it out. Uh, the week of, this week right here guys, June 8th, can you guys see my calendar? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The week of June 8th through yeah. June 12th, normally this would be what we call finals week, right? So you guys remember in the fall last year, you know, the finals week, but now, Obviously, we can't do that. And I was telling Felipe, hopefully your teachers, you know, I'm sure they know this, but um, most teachers that I've talked to, we're not doing finals because it's, it just wouldn't work, right? If students haven't been checking in, if students don't have an iPad working at home, like to expect this huge final to take place that covers everything over the year and they've missed most of the year, it just wouldn't be fair, right? So the week of June 8th through 12th normally would have been your final exam week, but we're not gonna have that. So the week of June 1st through the 5th and the week of June 8th through 12th, these are still gonna be instructional weeks. So that means we have two weeks to cover this last module that I'm gonna show you. So let's go to my folders. So our last module is, um, I'm sad that we're not in the class to do this, guys, because ecology is like one of my favorite topics, because this is where we finally get to talk about animals. This is where we get to talk about those relationships that we were just talking about. Um, so ecology, I already set up the folders, but if you click on the folders, they're not, they're not complete, okay? All I've really added is just ecology. These may change just because for the sake of time, I don't know that we have time to do my typical module assignments. So I'll, I'll tweak them a little bit, but let's just go ahead and get started to see what this unit's all about. So we're gonna watch my little learning objective on ecology. So listen up, turn your speakers on real quick. All right, here we go. So a quick little video. Hi guys, so for this last module, we're going to be looking at the last um, few units that we haven't looked at in biology, and it's gonna be ecosystems. And ecosystems is a pretty large uh, unit, but um, because of time, I'm gonna try to condense a few chapters into a small section, and um, I'm just gonna be picking and choosing from chapters 13, 14, and 15 to see if we can cover this in the next week or so. It is a lot to cover, but I think we can do it. And uh, this is something you'll discover further in your environmental science classes coming up in the next year or two. So ecosystems uh, essentially deals with interactions, energy, and dynamics. And so for, for this module, we're gonna be looking at lots of things, but the main focus of ecosystems is how things are interdependent. Uh, the types of relationships that exist within ecosystems. And so one of the ways that we can do that is to look at representations that explain how a caring capacity is reached within an ecosystem and what are the factors that are leading it to reach that caring capacity or limit. The other thing we're going to look at is, is um, what is affecting biodiversity and populations in that ecosystem. We're also going to be looking at how matter or energy gets cycled within an ecosystem, again, because ecosystems depend largely on, on, on relationships. So matter and energy are these two things that cycle back and forth between an ecosystem. We're also then going to be looking at, sorry, we're going to be looking at how the cycles, um, 
such as the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, etc., affect what we call the biosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the geosphere, also known as the living planet, the uh, air that we breathe, the bodies of water, and the, the land masses. Lastly, we're going to be looking at how these interactions um, are maintained consistently um, in spite of changes that are brought forth in an ecosystem model. If we have time, I wanted us to talk about the human impact or what our role is in affecting biodiversity. Um, again, this is something you will explore in your environmental science classes, so if we don't get a chance to talk about that here, you will later, but for sure, the first uh, <laughs> that I showed you on the slide are going to be what's going to be um, discussed in today's module. So as always, please feel free to rewatch this video and good luck. Thanks, guys. All right. So that'll be where we're going to um, start on, on Friday. So if you go into my ecology uh, folder, you have that learning objective video you can rewatch. And then if you look here, the ecology unit, like I said in the video, I'm lumping it. It's three chapters. And so what I want to do is this module, I don't want it to be like the past modules because for the past modules, like we had, and you know, we had a lot more time for one, but ecology, like I, like I was asking you guys at the beginning before you guys jumped in, um, is ecology deals with relationships, deals with interactions. And so I'm envisioning doing a cool project for this. And in class, like I was telling Felipe and Jaime before you guys got here, like I always used to do cool ecology projects where I would have people go outside and like survey um, populations of, of species and, and talk about what's limiting uh, and what's maintaining those numbers. But you know, I, we can't do that. I can't have you go outside right now. So I'm trying to brainstorm in my, in my brain here how we could get um, the heart of ecology in some cool project form. Um, more on that to come, right? So if you go to my ecology module, like I was just saying for Vanessa, Alexa, Noemi, and Daisy who are just popping in, I have the folder set up, but for now they're, they're kind of empty just because I haven't really decided what our project is going to be. Um, I have past projects I've done, but it all involves you guys like doing stuff and, and we can't go outside right now, like Christian was saying. Like, so, so there has to be some difference, okay? What I'm definitely not going to do, though, is we're not going to have a final exam. I don't want to do a final exam. I want us to do something where you can demonstrate that you understand ecology and interactions. So I may put like one assignment. It'll probably be, um, you know, I have tons of documentaries on, on ecosystems that I can show you. Maybe I'll go through those and assign you like one of them, like we did for the evolution video. Um, We'll have a short quiz. Um, I think I already have an idea for a discussion board, but the summative assessment, let me think on that, okay? Like I said, I would love for you guys to, to be outside interacting and, and seeing ecosystems in action. Um, you know, I would normally send students for extra credit to the zoo, to a park, to capture in action, like how systems are interacting, but we can't do that right now. So let me ponder and figure out an alternative for that, okay? But for now, the folder is set up. Please just start by looking at my learning objective and I have all the notes. I haven't finished the chapter 15 notes because again, it's, I'm condensing it all, but 13 and 14 are all good to go. So if you wanna get a head start and read that, uh, I'll post the quiz. Um, we'll say no later than um, next Friday will be the due date for the quiz. Um, and then June 12th, which is the last day of school, that week, June 8th through 12th, you'll be submitting some form of a summative assessment. And I, I may do it something similar to, you know, like your natural selection simulation, where maybe you can demonstrate something to me, but I haven't decided yet. So please be patient with me. Um, but I will take it easy with you that week of June 8th to June 12th, because I imagine, like I was asking Felipe, you probably have a lot of teachers that are doing some like last project that week, right? So the week of June 8th through June 12th, um, we will have some form of a summative assessment for me, um, but it will not be a test. Sound like a plan? Yes. 
Okay, okay. cool. All right, cool. So before we get into ecology, because like I said, that's what we're going to do on Friday. Okay, on Friday, we're going to hit this hard and we'll, I'll, I'll try to have like an idea for that project. And if you guys have recommendations, um, well, actually, let me ask you guys. Um, you guys have studied ecology uh, when you guys took life science, right? To a little bit. You guys covered this a little bit? Uh, yeah. Okay. And yeah. what, what sorts of like assignments, projects, labs did you guys do for ecology? Maybe you can help me figure this out. I think we did one where um, like we had like paper like dots, or, like squares that were like different colors. Uh -huh. And they represent like either like different species or different variations of that species. Okay. And then we would change like I don't remember what the variable was, but we would change a variable, and depending on that, it would like change like the species rate of survival or like how many of the mm -hmm. species okay. were there in which variation. Okay. Okay. Anyone else have any um, recommendations or want to share like past activities they've done for ecosystems that maybe we could use for this unit? I don't remember my projects much. You don't remember? Okay. Anyone else taking suggestions? I think it's kind of like what Mills was talking about, or like in class, it was kind of like, the problem is it was a kind of like a whole class interaction where there was some praise and then there was like predators. Mm, okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll see how we can do that from home because that's the difference, right? Dizzy is like, we're not in the class, so we can't like simulate these things but um i i trust i can i can find something and, and i'll take if you guys want to send me some of your ideas or recommendations um i'll i'll make a pitch to you guys on friday or so and we'll see if i can figure out something but that's for friday um what i wanted to do today is uh, finish up evolution so we're we're in the home stretch here guys um so um, you already did your evolution assignments. Um, your formative assessment was the quiz that um, a lot of you took. Some of you probably still need to take it. So just message me and I'll turn it on for you. Uh, thank you for the evolution discussion board. I commented on everybody. So please read my feedback. Um, and thank you summative assessment people that turned in their um, natural selection simulation. Okay. Those I'm going to start grading real soon, but everything else I think I've already graded. So fantastic job, guys. Let's finish up the last section of chapter 11 notes. So any questions before I move on to chapter 11 and finish this up here? Any questions, guys? Questions? No, I'm okay. You're all good? Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and wrap up chapter 11. Um, chapter 11. Where was it? In the wrong folder, so. All right. Oh. Chapter 11, here it is. So where we left off, we were on chapter 11 and we were covering uh, different uh, mechanisms of, of evolution, right? So we got into sexual selection, we got into um, gene flow, genetic drift. Um, and so now I want to pick up from there. And we watched this little short video called Survival of the Sexiest, where we looked at birds of prey and how sexual selection is another way that animals have these really extravagant you know, headdresses and colors and things that kind of stand out, right? Because if natural selection is, 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 is telling us that the way to survive is to be fit, and remember we saw that little comic strip where being fit wasn't necessarily being, you know, the, having the loudest chirp or call, right? So it, sometimes it was just being the quietest, being the sneakiest was being fit. So natural selection isn't obviously the only way that evolution occurs because there's also sexual selection. There's also gene flow, genetic drift. Well, how do we know that evolution is occurring? That's called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So um, in the Nuzella article that you read, there was this equation called Hardy-Weinberg. So it was the work of uh, two uh, independent researchers, um, Hardy, um, a British, and Weinberg was German. And they came up with basically the same equation that, that shows us that evolution is occurring. Um, and they use genetics to prove that. 
And so can you read us please, Vanessa, what is first the Hardy-Weinberg principle before I explain the equation? All right, the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Allele of frequency in a population will remain constant unless one or more factors causes those frequencies to change. Yeah, meaning if, if, if the following things are not occurring, well, then evolution happens, okay? And so equilibrium just means balance. But what they meant by balance is genes, or in this case, alleles, right? So what they're saying that is if, if all the alleles stay the same, then nothing is happening. Um, but what we're gonna soon discover is that's kind of impossible. It's kind of impossible for alleles not to change. We looked at sexual selection. We looked at gene flow. Does anyone remember in your own words, what was gene flow, Jaime? What was gene flow? Um, do you have help on this? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the name kind of gives it away, Jaime. Gene flow. So what do you think is happening? The flow of the gene. Yeah, but what does that mean to you? Um, <laughs> think about it. Uh, Who can help out, Jaime? What is gene flow? Um, I can help. Yeah. So it's like when two variations of a species are like suddenly like introduced to each other, whether it be like breaking of a barrier or like yeah. them like exploring. Yeah, exactly. So, like, so their genes like mix together as like. Yeah, they, they go from here to there because now a barrier is no longer there, right? So that's kind of impossible for, for alleles to remain constant then because like Vanessa just said, like people move, right? And like we saw in genetic drift, like disasters happen, right? Um, animals evolve on islands. It's been happening for millions of years. Mutations happen, sexual selection happens. So to say that everything's going to be in equilibrium or balance all the time is kind of silly. So what the Hardy-Weinberg principle is, is just showing you why it's impossible that evolution cannot occur, okay? Meaning it will always occur. And so the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium essentially is a breakdown of the following five things. And I know the article broke it down into seven, but yeah. Let's stick to what the book says. There's really just the five, okay? So can you read me, please? What are the five factors? Um, how about uh, Felipe? What are the five factors of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? All right. Number one, no, no natural selection. Number two, no mutations. Number three, there cannot be no movement into or out of the population, no migration. Number four, the population must be very large. Number five, random mating. Right, and so what this is saying, and again, equilibrium means balance, okay? What equilibrium means is, again, nothing is changing. But let me ask you a question, okay? From the examples we talked about, like the one Vanessa just gave you, or that video I showed you about the birds of paradise, or even that comic strip that we read that Vanessa narrated for us, um, do these things ever happen in nature? according to all the things we've been watching, is there, is there, is there ever, is there ever not going to be a mutation? No. No. I mean, you guys did an article. Jaime, I read your, I read your, your PowerPoint that you did on mutations. Remember for, for, for the genetics thing, there's always mutations. Genetic mutations are this, that, that's, that's part of like being, a human with DNA, like mutations occur left and right. Um, is there, is there, is there, is it possible for there to be no migration, Vanessa? Mm. I feel like there would have to be like at least a small region, like even if it's like around the area they are, because they're constantly like looking for like food and resources to like. Exactly. Exactly. Right. They have. They have to migrate. Right. Think about birds. You can't just stop birds from migrating, right? Um, is 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 mating random in nature? Yes. Yeah. How, yeah, how, 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 is, how is it random? 
Well, it's random in the way where you can't choose your mate, so it'll come by chance of who your, your mate's going to be. In the wait, 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 wait. What do you mean you can't choose your mate? Didn't we just say well, you sexual can, selection? But, like, <laughs> you're never going to know it, though. Like, so it's but my, random. Like, it's a random, like, person. Or, like, no, but that's, okay, not, that's not what I mean, Felipe. I mean, I mean, are you just, like, like, in the old days, are you just, like, betrothed? To someone, is that how the animal kingdom works? Like, oh no, no, we no, we choose, and no. animals choose, right? The the, no. most, the most attractive that's sexual selection, right? So, check it out the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium is basically nonsense. What the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium is saying is these five things are impossible in nature, and so because these five things can never happen. There's always evolution. So check it out. The Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and equilibrium means balance. I'm telling you, it is, is not, is not it's, it's purposely meant to be false, okay? They're saying the only way evolution could never occur is that these five things never happen, meaning there's never natural selection. But we know that's not true. We know that's not true. We've been talking about natural selection for an entire chapter. That's what Darwin talked about. That's what, that's what that chapter was all about. We know from genetics, from chapter 12, uh, ch sorry, chapter 8 and 9 on DNA and protein synthesis, that mutations occur all the time. We know, like Vanessa just told us, that there's always migration. That's what gene flow is. We know that populations grow all the time, right? That's what Thomas Malthus and Felipe, you brought up Malthus. We know that populations grow, and we know that there's always going to be competition. And like we saw in the video on uh, the sexual selection, mating is never random because when it comes to sexual selection, basically, the, like the video said, the sexier you are, the more chances you are of getting a mate. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Okay, perfect. I hope so. Yeah. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is, is, is purposely never going to be reached. It's kind of like, it's, it's a constant. They're saying, this is why evolution will occur, because these five things do not happen in real life. There's never going to be no mutations, right? There will never be a lack of migration. There will never be mates being selected on purpose, right? Mating is not random, right? You don't just randomly choose who to go out with, right? You select. So the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is telling us evolution will always occur. Here's the equation, okay? Now, I'm not going to get in too much into the equation because this is not a math class, but it's, it's a really easy equation. In fact, there's two equations here. So from the article, um, thank you, those of you that submitted it to me, um, we remember what the P and the Q stand for. Right. So in the article you read, um, the, the lowercase p uh, designates uh, the dominant allele in a population. Q represents the recessive allele. And one just represents the total number of individuals in the population. Okay. So for example, let's say we're talking about uh, a population here and we're saying 60% um, of them have like a dark hair allele like me and 40% of them have uh, a lighter colored hair allele. So this would be an example that, that and, and we represent the Hardy-Weinberg in decimals, so we wouldn't say 60%. We would say 0.6 is going to be P, 0.4 is going to be Q, and they equal 1. So let's see, how many people do we have in this group? There's eight of us, right? So let's say, again, uh, let's see, Christian, you have the lightest hair here, I believe, right? Let's say um, Christian is the only person in this room, and he represents 0.4 of this population. The rest of us have dark hair where the point six. So the one equals all eight of us, okay? Um, the other equation though, for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is the, is the more um, quadratic looking one, right? So it's, it's, it's P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one. And all this is really trying to tell us is that P2 represents the individuals in that population that are homozygous dominant, meaning they are, for example, big A, big A. Your 2PQ represents the individuals that have two different alleles, so it would be like uppercase A, lowercase A, and Q2 would be uh, homozygous recessive or little a, little a. 
So using the previous values from the slide I just showed you, if, if P was represented by 0.6, the way you would calculate this is you would just square 0.6 plus uh, 0.6 and 0.4 multiplied by two plus your Q squared, which was again 0.4, if you square that, that would equal the total population. And so that would give us numbers, right? So the way you solve for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is they would give you a math problem, they would give you one variable or a few variables, and you would have to solve for the other. And if you compare populations over time, right? So if so, we now know, you know, we now know what each allele represents. And this one actually shows us just the frequency of alleles, right? And alleles are just the letters. But this one shows us the genotype. Remember, genotypes are the letters that you get from both parents that determine the trait. So what the, the, what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium allows us to do then is using just simple algebra, we can calculate, okay, in the first generation, how many uh, Ps were there? And then later on, a couple of generations later, what changed, right? So if we were looking at our classroom and over time, um, Christian's uh, uh, recessive allele went up, the Hardy-Weinberg equation just allows us to solve for what changed over time, okay? So that's what we use it for. It's just a simple mathematical, it's a very simple algebra, it's just solving for P, solving for Q. But what it does, which is very eloquent, is it helps us to, to at the small level, see what genes change over time. So that's what the Hardy-Weinberg uh, is, okay? And so there's a short little video here. I'm gonna let you watch that video on your own. It shows you how to calculate for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And I don't wanna go into much more of it other than just what was mentioned in the article, but please watch that video on your own. Um, okay, so what does this have to do then with, with evolution? Well, speciation is ultimately what we refer to as macro evolution. And like I told you guys earlier, there's two kinds of evolution, right? We have micro and we have macro. Macro is the big one. Macro is the one where something turns into something else, where, um, for example, um, if we're talking about uh, dinosaurs and birds, going back to my very, very first slide for this, for this chapter, I showed you, I showed you uh, uh, dinosaurs here, then I showed you like a little sparrow here. Speciation is what we refer to as like that, that ultimate, um, well, like where evolution ends, okay? And so the key to speciation is, is genetics. Like we just saw, um, evolution and genetics work hand in hand. So what we're gonna talk about now is what we refer to as a reproductive isolation. Because if you think about this, right, if we're if going back to Vanessa's example, if, if there can't be migration, right, which is impossible, but let's say we, we, we can't migrate and we cannot get our genes to flow, meaning we can't get to this other population that has different genes. Well, that's a problem because that would mean that the two groups or two populations would never exchange DNA with one another. And this does happen in nature. When that happens, like let's say, for example, we're talking about the continent of Africa and the island of Madagascar, like I mentioned the other day. So if, if, the, so if my hand is, is, is Africa, or actually here, if my phone is Africa and my little mouse here is Madagascar, Madagascar floated away from Africa, like I had told you guys, okay? But now the species on this island and this continent are no longer together. So they cannot, their genes can no longer flow, okay? And what happens is a population becomes isolated, meaning they can't exchange DNA anymore. So now that gene pool, guess what happens to it? If they can't exchange DNA anymore, No, um, evolution occurs. Well, yeah, there can't be evolution because there, 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 there's no, there's no new DNA being introduced anymore. Does that make sense? So, like, if if the island of of Madagascar was once on Africa, that's a that's a big continent. I mean, there's a lot of DNA. There's a lot of a lot of individuals there. 
But now, if you get the smaller population on this little island that floats away, Jaime, can it now, can it exchange DNA with the mainland anymore? No, it cannot. It cannot, it cannot, meaning there is no gene flow. There's no gene flow. Does that make sense, Jaime? There's no gene flow here. The problem, yeah. the problem with that, guys, is not only are these animals away from the mainland, but they now exist in a state that we call reproductive isolation, meaning they cannot reproduce. They cannot mate. And because they can't mate, now their DNA is no longer a part of this bigger gene pool, meaning now the availability of different genes, different traits for survival has gotten a lot smaller, okay? So that repro reproductive isolation is what we refer to as the final step. The final step before evolution, meaning if you get to reproductive isolation, meaning you can no longer mate, if these animals on this Madagascar island can no longer mate with the continent of Africa animals, they're isolated reproductively, no more genes. That's, that's bad. Well, it's not bad, but what's going to happen now is they're going to evolve into their own thing. Okay. And reproductive isolation leads to speciation. Speciation is just what it sounds like. It's the creation of a new species. So this is what evolution is, the big evolution. Okay. So um, how does speciation occur? There's three ways. They're called behavioral barriers, geographic barriers, and temporal barriers. Okay. And they are what they sound like. So one of them is a barrier due to behavior, meaning the way animals act. A geographic barrier is a barrier due to, you know, physical structures, physical objects, physical, uh, you know, mountains, rivers, gorges. And then temporal barriers have to do more with like uh, seasons, okay? So let's go over each. A behavioral barrier is something like this, okay? So I love birds, and I think I've told you guys before, I'm a bird nerd. And a behavioral barrier would occur like this. There are two birds um, known as the eastern and the western meadowlark. They, they look very, very similar, okay? In fact, to most people, these look like the same bird. Don't they look like the same bird, guys? Look closely. No. What's different about them, Jaime? Um, one of them is like um, it's um, more like um, more stripes, and one of them is more like polka dots, like on the side of the yellow of its yellow part of its um, um, chest. Okay, good. So it has. Different... I don't know if um, wait. You you no you 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 you're true, Jaime. Mean, it it does have differences. Thank you for circling. You can see very good. You can see differences in in speculation, but. The other difference, the one that's, that's more subtle, that only a bird nerd like myself probably would, would oh, realize. The well, the beak too, you're right. But that's only due to speciation, Jaime. They have become two different species. These birds are not the same bird. These birds can't even have babies with one another. They're different birds. And I know to most people, you're like, nah. Those are the same stupid bird. They're not the same bird, actually. It's been genetically proven. These birds are not the same bird. And one of the ways that this occurred was because of a behavioral isolation, meaning the way that they behave and what we mean by behavior in terms of birds are things like courtship. So does anyone know why birds sing? Is it to show off? No, to attract to or attract. to alert? It's well, well, they alert. You're, you're right, Felipe. But the main reason why birds sing is, is mating. It's to attract a partner. And so these two birds, guys, because, because they're they act differently, their songs are so different. They actually stopped reproducing with one another a long time ago. And because they just selected, oh, I don't like that guy. He's got a bad song. 
I like this one instead because they sound like me. They sing like me. Their behavior has been so different. They evolve into two different species of birds. And yeah, they have some subtle differences in markings, like Jaime said, and the beak. But it's more than that. They're genetically different because of the way they act. Isn't that insane, guys? It's crazy. So that's called the behavioral barrier. The other type of isolation is the more obvious one, and that's what we call a geographic barrier. And this is something you're familiar with, right? You guys have heard of the Arctic fox, right? Yes. You guys watched hopefully a lot of a lot of uh, nature documentaries. So the Arctic fox is different than the standard gray foxes that we get here in uh, the United States. Okay, Arctic foxes, like the name, oh my God, come on, cat. Like the name implies, are only found in the Arctic. So you find them in Greenland, you find them in Canada, you find them in Alaska. Well, it's not just the color that makes them a different species, guys. Um, that's kind of the result of the speciation, but the reason they're so different is because these animals are divided. These animals actually can't, can't get to one another anymore. Now, of course, you know this from what we've talked about in uh, previous modules that our planet has evolved too, not just animals, but the land masses have moved, our continents have moved. And so these animals now, the Arctic fox and the gray fox, are separated by mountains and oceans that weren't there in the past. And so they've become so isolated geographically because of now we have this huge mountain range like the Rockies that traverse like most of uh, Canada and a huge part of the US. Um, they can't reach each other anymore. That physical barrier, guys, is what we call a geographic isolation. They have become isolated and they can no longer interact. They no longer mate. Their genes don't flow anymore. They are now a new species. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. All right, last one. It's called a temporal barrier. Temporal refers to uh, mating seasons, okay? So these two frogs here that you see here, um, the reason they uh, don't mate is because they just have different internal clocks. So these guys mate from January to March. These guys breed March to May. So they're actually not even fertile at the same time. Why that is, there's many reasons why environment being the main one, right? Uh, different parts of the world because of seasons don't have the same climate at the same time of year. So these frogs, based on where they live, the seasons are not the same in, in both areas of the world where they live. So they've adapted their mating rituals, mating timing to their environment. So because their mating season has changed them so much, which was what we call a temporal isolation, these frogs are not even the same frog anymore. Boom, evolution. Okay, um, now I wanna tell you about, um, now that we know what evolution is, we know how the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium you know, gives us that little algebraic equation to see genetically what is changing, like what isn't flowing, right? Because um, what this shows us is what exactly flowed or didn't flow, right? And what the results are. But there's different ways that evolution happens. And so I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of terms and we're gonna end right here. Convergent evolution. You guys have probably seen those book series, Convergent, Divergent. Um, what that means to converge is, is, it means to come together, okay? So these species here, uh, a bat, a butterfly, a bird, we've talked about these these traits right and we said that these these traits which we refer to as analogous traits um they do the same thing right so so bats fly because of their wings butterflies fly because of their wings birds fly because of their wings but are birds and butterflies directly related no no right but the reason that they have evolved these similar traits is because of their environment so when that happens, when animals develop the same traits due to similar need, we call, excuse me, we call that a convergent evolution. The same can be seen in a shark and a dolphin. So hopefully you're not in the ocean one day and you see 
a fin sticking out. Um, if you are, there's a way to tell the difference between a shark and a dolphin. So does anyone know how you, like just by looking at the fin, does anyone know how to tell the difference between a shark and a dolphin if only the fin is sticking out? This is called the dorsal fin, by the way. Does anyone know how to tell the difference? And we're gonna pause in a second here. Does anyone know the, the how to curvature? tell the difference? So this is called the dorsal fin, okay? And this is called the dorsal fin on a dolphin. How do you tell the difference? What, what about the curvature over there? Like the dolphin fin's more curved than the shark? Uh, generally, yeah. But it could also be know. like how much of the fin shows out of okay. the water since the dolphin's fin shorter. Okay, what else? Uh, color, maybe? No, you won't be able to tell by color. Again, imagine, here, let, let me draw you the water here, okay? Let's say this is the water line. Okay, <laughs> that's the water line. Let me erase this. Okay, how, how can you tell which one's a dolphin and which one is a, is a shark? How can the you tell? size, the shape of it, the size. Like. It's not the size. There are, there are uh, dolphins that are pretty big and there are sharks that are very small. It's not the size. Alexa, what do you think? How can you tell the difference between a shark and a dolphin? Alexa? Oh, um, I don't know, but it seems like the tail is also sticking out in here. Thank you. Come here, guys. Look, dolphins do not have. Oops, let me turn off. Hold on. Right here, because dolphins do not have this fin. This is called a caudal fin. C A U D A L. They do not have a caudal fin. A caudal fin basically just means tail fin. The reason dolphins don't have them. Does anyone know why dolphins don't have that fin, by the way? I'll give you a hint. Dolphins are mammals, not fish. Why do you think dolphins don't have a caudal fin? Thinking back to what we said in evolution and anatomy, why don't dolphins have a caudal fin? Come on, guys, think critically. I'm not giving answers here. I think it would get in their way of like what's called making offspring. Because, like, fish, I think, lay eggs. But, like, if a dolphin was like a mammal, it would have to like make like the body of the like offspring would already be inside the dolphin. So it would have oh. to. Oh, okay. I, I didn't think about that, Vanessa. But yeah, you might be onto something. But the, the reason is because. Uh, Dolphins are mammals and they actually have the same bones as you. Um, these are legs, guys. These, these are legs that have, that have evolved to this shape. These are not legs on a fish. Um, so yeah, if you're ever stuck in the middle of the ocean and you see, uh, this is called a dorsal fin, by the way. If you ever see a dorsal fin and an accompanying caudal fin, you better swim. Okay, but if you only see this, and yeah, it has to do with the curvature, Felipe, I'm not gonna lie, but um, that's not always the case because there are sharks that have very large fins and very small fins, and there are dolphins that have very, very big fins. And don't forget, killer whales are dolphins. Um, so no, it has, it's not just that. So they have evolved similar looking body types because of their environment, all right? And I'm gonna go ahead and, and wrap up here. So that's called convergent evolution, okay? Um, the other way that evolution occurs is what we call a diversion evolution, where species that are the same have been pushed to two different directions because of their environment. An example of that would be a woolly mammoth and a regular elephant. Woolly mammoths lived in environments that were very, very cold. So they developed this, this you know, furry coat, whereas African elephants live obviously in Africa where it's very, very hot. So they got pushed into different directions, right? A common example that we've already looked at, guys, is Darwin. All of his birds, that's divergent evolution. They have been forced to look differently. Obviously, natural selection is, is, is the how, but what happened is they ended up splitting physically, right? They ended up splitting and looking differently because of divergent evolution. There's a quick little video you can watch on that for your own pleasure. And lastly, 
coevolution. Coevolution is what happens when two uh, species of a flora and fauna or plant and animal evolve together. An example of that, the most common example, which you already know, is pollinators. So uh, hummingbirds that have like crazy beaks like this feed on the flowers that evolve this very, very unique um, structure so that only that bird can feed from it. That's what we call coevolution. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap up with extinction. The last pattern of evolution, which is the one that we don't want to get to and hopefully we don't get to, is what happens when a species is just completely lost from this planet. And there have been five major extinction events. You've probably heard of at least one of them, and that's this one, the KT event, which is the 65 million year old, you know, it's what they made lots of Jurassic Park movies about, but this KT extinction event represents what happened between the Cretaceous and uh, what we call the Triassic period or the um, tertiary period. This is when um, large reptiles were wiped off the face of this earth. Not all of them disappeared, obviously, because some survived to become modern day birds. Um, and all of these extinction events mark a significant point in our planet's history where large amounts of species were wiped forever off the face of this earth. The biggest one being right here. This is called the Permian extinction. This is when 90% of all life on our planet disappeared. Um, this marks like the, again, when mostly everything was wiped off the face of the earth. This one is talked about because again, this is when dinosaurs went extinct, but they didn't really go extinct and not all of them went extinct, right? We still have uh, a lot of their cousins like crocodiles, birds, um, large lizards. Uh, it's just marked and uh, again, it's where all the movies are made from, but there have been five major ones, okay? So uh, that's evolution in a nutshell. That's how we can measure it. That's how we define how it shapes different things. And again, it always happens. And it's been proven. We have equations to prove it. We have lots of evidence. So thank you for all of you that submitted your letters to the editor. Please read my notes so I can let you know what you missed in your letter. And uh, I'll go ahead and pause there, guys. So we did it. We got through evolution. Like I said, Friday, we'll start talking about ecology. So feel free to start looking at the notes. Uh, but I'll go ahead and pause there and I'll take any questions you guys have for me now. So what uh, what questions you guys have? Well, I have one about the coevolution thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So like, let's say for like the hummingbirds with the, the birds with a really weird beak and the flower. Uh -huh. So if the flower were to just like, you know, get wiped out or you, hummingbirds couldn't find anymore would that lead to them being endangered for the birds well, that's a great question daisy and i'm glad you're asking that because that's that's what ecology is all about is understanding the relationships between those so so that's why i went in this order is because genetics set up where traits come from right it comes from natural variations in dna and evolution and natural selection showed us that if you got the right trait for the right environment that trait gets passed on. But you hit the nail on the head there, Daisy. What if now the thing that shaped that animal to begin with is no longer there? We're gonna talk about that in ecology because we're gonna talk about things like keystone species, things that are so important to an environment survival that if you remove one of them, you affect the entire system. So ecology, which is the unit we're going to talk about in ecosystems has to do with what would happen okay because evolution and genetics we were just looking at kind of how one thing was shaped but ecology now we're going to look at how one affects the other affects the other does that make sense daisy but to give you the short answer of that it depends it depends because um First of all, remember, variations exist. So that, that's not to say that there aren't hummingbirds that don't have a beak that's slightly different, right? And that's not to say that there aren't flowers that are similar, right, that it can also feed on. But what we're going to really talk about in, sorry, I'm not going to 
pop culture, what we're going to talk about in, in ecology is what you're saying is how would one species be affected if something were to disappear? Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to get into. But the short answer of that, Daisy, is it, 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 it's, not as, it's not instant. It's not instant, right? Um, you guys have heard of the fact that, and I, this is something that Einstein said, if, uh, you know, if bees disappeared, humans would be dead like in, in like a month. Have you, have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay, think about this. And yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end right here, okay? What do bees do for you guys? They pollinate. Pa pollinate. Did, did you guys know that bees actually pollinate about 90% of the crops that we depend on? No. Yeah, it's insane. We need bees like you do not imagine. Now, of course, there are you know, other food sources. We know that, right? And if all you eat is meat, 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 you probably don't care, right? Because you're like, eh, I don't eat vegetables. I don't eat crops. What do I care? But remember, like we just said with Daisy, one thing affects the other, affects the other, affects the other. So wiping out a species like a bee, which is a pollinator, is so important. And it's so important that we actually give it a special name. We call it keystone. Keystone is a term we refer to something that like if this arch is a bridge or something the keystone is the centerpiece that holds the whole structure together and so hello oh i think i froze here sorry um so we're going to look at what happens if you remove a species and what it does to every other species so i'll go ahead and pause there because i don't want to give away too much so that's for ecology but great question daisy any other questions guys I'm good. All right, cool. So we'll see you guys on Friday. Hopefully um, you guys get a chance to catch up on any late things you're missing. I think most of you gave me your natural selection simulation, but I'm just waiting a few. So please go ahead and submit me that as soon as you can and let me know if you want me to turn on the quiz, okay? All right, yeah, Mr. See you on Friday. Bye, guys. Stay safe. Bye, Mr. Yeah.